Hi, I'm Max Spainauer. And I'm Troy McCormick. Welcome to Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Welcome to Indiana Outdoor Adventures. I'm Troy McCormick, and we're here at the much sought after start line of the Tecumseh Trail Marathon today. The uh, group called Dino, Do Indiana Off-Road, is hosting a 26.2 mile marathon run today in the Yellowwood State Forest. Now we are east of Bloomington, but the start line was supposed to be 24 miles north of here. Last night's uh, uh, clipper storm from the north came down and brought with it uh, uh, almost four inches of snow, uh, sleet, and freezing rain. The roads are iced over. It actually became too treacherous to get the buses of over 700 runners in the marathon up to the start line, which was way up in the Yellowwood State Forest. Uh, in fact, uh, I made it there and was uh, at the start line, but only a few other people were there at the uh, about 45 minutes before the race started uh, the decision was made by the uh, organizers to go ahead and bring the runners and start the event at the finish line uh, it's taken me an hour and a half just to drive that uh, uh, 24 miles because of the roads have been uh, blocked by cars that have slid off the road uh, one accident uh, car slid into a tree we had paramedics and ambulances uh, and police on site it really has been a nasty nasty kind of a storm to try and drive in uh, the uh, marathoner started about uh, uh, 45 minutes to an hour ago and are off on the run they've changed the route and they're going to start here at the finish line run the trail backwards up to station 13 where they'll then circle and work their way back to the finish line. So we're going to try and uh, jump back up the trail a ways and uh, find a spot where we can catch up with the marathon runners and uh, join them as they're out running in uh, a little bit of a nasty uh, kind of a day. The temperature's hovering around 30 degrees. Uh, but they'll be generating some heat may have some soggy shoes when they get done and a little wet on top of their heads. Uh, but I'm sure they're going to uh, uh, enjoy themselves in the woods because it really is beautiful when you look at it from uh, an aesthetic point of view. Well, let's uh, go see if we can find some runners on the Tecumseh Trail Marathon here at the Yellowwood State Forest today. Just making sure people turn here. So are, you, are you volunteering for Dino or why are you involved with helping out today? I'm volunteering. I belong to the Hoosier Hikers Council. Okay. And they're the people who do this race as a fundraiser. Okay. And do you know how many runners we do have today? I know we'd sold out at 700, but I don't know if everybody made it today or not. I really don't know. Haven't heard me either. No. Uh, some, people, some people think that, I, I'm not sure, but just my, uh, you know, uh, hearing a little bit of talking here that they're, they're thinking the footing isn't too bad. Well, fortunately, the temperature's hovering around 30, so it hasn't frozen solid. It's just kind of slush more than, uh, except in places. Yeah, and I don't know why it's back, you know, back behind. Yeah. If there's a place where there's some exposed clay and there's a little bit of slope. Might be slick. Yeah, that could be a problem. Yeah. What were the roads like coming in this morning? A mess. <laughs> I, I, I came in from Bloomington early this morning. There was only one car going my direction, and it was way down in the ditch. <laughs> and so it was like my truck was just uh, fishtailing a lot of the way. Yeah. 
And uh, but I'm a very conservative driver, so I stayed on the road. Slow and steady, and you yeah. made it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're somewhere around the uh, eight-mile mark. We finally did catch up with some of the runners. Uh, the marathoners have been working their way through, coming up over the hill, working their way down, back up the next hill. They're on a county road for a short stretch, and then they're back into the woods on the narrow trails. So if you're going to make a move, uh, change position, these wide roads is where you have that opportunity to do so. These ups and downs on the trail today, you got to run a little bit, you walk a little bit, conserve your energy, push when you can, work the downhills, uh, and work your way slowly back the uphills. This is southern Indiana with lots of hills, ravines, and steep hills uh, to have to work up and down, but the runners seem to be making uh, the best of it. Cave Country Canoes, located in the heart of Indiana's cave country, offers a variety of canoe rental trips from half-day outings for beginners to two-day adventures for the more experienced enthusiast. Our canoe trips follow the gently meandering Blue River through the wooded hills of southern Indiana. Abundant wildlife and great fishing opportunities abound. Go to CaveCountryCanoes.com for more information about our canoe and kayak trips. Your next adventure is just a paddle away. Here at White House Whitetails, after 20 years of growing trophy bucks, we have developed a product called Buck Bullets, a hybrid supplement. Buck Bullets is not only designed to be an excellent attractant, but also a fully loaded supplement to improve antler growth and health of your deer herd. It can be used in your backyard wooded area or in your hunting area. You too can add at least 10 to 20 inches of antler to bucks in your hunting area the first year with Buck Bullets' fully loaded hybrid supplement. Sugar Camp Lodge offers some of Indiana's finest trophy deer and wild turkey hunting opportunities. We have 400 acres of woods, marshes, and farmland that provides amazing habitats to hunt. You'll enjoy great meals and accommodations in our beautifully remodeled 1850s lodge. Sugar Camp Lodge is available for meetings, get-togethers, and special occasions. Visit us online at www.sugarcamplodge.com for more information and to book your next hunting adventure. After serving our country, serious injury shouldn't prevent our veterans from enjoying life. Paralyzed Veterans of America works with veterans to ensure that their health care and benefit needs are met, provides assistance with career needs, and offers challenging and rewarding activities. The Kentucky and Indiana chapter of PVA is proud to provide adaptive sports for members that includes hunting, fishing, trap and skeet shooting, bowling, and billiards. Visit us online to learn more about Paralyzed Veterans of America. And looks like our race leader is arriving, number three. Oh, seven, Luke. Welcome to the finish line of the Cubs Trail Marathon. Luke Flory from Bloomington, Indiana, taking the win at 3.23. And about 30 seconds. Luke, you got first. Jonathan, you got second. It's been quite a day today. Tell me a little bit about, uh, about the race, the weather conditions. What was it like out there? Well, I mean, they changed the race up, obviously, to an out-and-back course from a point-to-point. Uh, that made it difficult coming back, facing all the other runners. I don't know how many hundreds of runners were out there. So that made it tough. The footing was tough, especially on the way out before the trail got packed down. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's a tough race. That's what you sign up for here, though. That's, that's what you get. This is my third year running it, third year in a row. Yeah, and what about the hills with the, the, the snow and the slipperiness of the... the... Uh, I, it was actually not as bad as I was expecting it to be, you know, with the snow and... There's so many roots and rocks on these trails out here that in some ways the snow packing down on top of that almost yeah. made it run smoother. So I sort of have weak ankles and usually the terrain out here slows me down, but it was almost like a nice smooth layer. It was a little slippery here and there, but um, yeah, it's kind of the day you just go out not knowing how you're going to feel. And I was happy. So. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Now you guys are both from Bloomington? Yep, we're both from Bloomington. Uh, 
we train together probably three, three or four days a week. So. Yeah. How do you train for a marathon like this? Well, well we, we train for, for other road races. Jonathan does triathlons and cycling quite a bit. Uh, but we train for the Chicago Marathon, and this is just kind of an end-of-the-season thing. This year we did something yeah. a bit different. There's a trail over uh, south on 446 called Pate Hollow. Yeah. That's, it's about a six- to seven-mile loop. So it's really similar to rugged terrain. So we do laps of that because it's closer to town. I know in years past we've come and like previewed this course, but we didn't really have time this year. And no. So. Of course, if you'd have previewed it this year, you'd have missed the first half of it anyway. That's true. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. We'd done it a couple times, so we were we were pretty familiar with it. So yeah. Com coming back, you had like salmon going upstream yeah. uh, with Good all problem. the other runners, but you knew the, the trail. Well, you could see it. Going out, there was only a couple sets of footprints in front of me, and I could tell a couple times where they had gone the wrong way and then turned around and come back. But fortunately, I had a few tracks in front of me all the way out. Um, How much of the race were you leading? Uh, I, I was second at the turnaround. I thought I was going to be about fourth. I don't know what happened to the two guys in between. Um, but then I, I caught the guy that was, that was leading, I think, at about mile 18. Mm -hmm. um, then the whole time after that, you know, you're running scared, thinking somebody's coming after you. I know this yeah. race has been won before by people coming, uh, catching people the last mile. Just so. around the around the lakes, yeah. probably some of the most rugged terrain. It's real windy and up and yeah. down. Uh, uh, when it does get narrow and windy, I mean, you really can't pass at that point. Well, it wasn't, wasn't too big of a deal, you know, for us. There wasn't a lot of passing, but unfortunately, the slower runners, the people coming... Uh, against us when we're when we're on our way back, and most of them just moved over. For yeah, us. yeah. So that was not as bad as I thought. So this morning when I heard it was out and back on the single track, I was pretty freaked out. But it, people, yeah, people kind of you know yeah. give each other. I, I got up to the, I got up to the start line at nine fifteen. Of course, there was nobody there, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it took me an hour and a half to drive the roads to get here, and I missed the start. Yeah. Um, What's it like when you've got that many runners at the start line? Is it a mad rush to try and get ahead? How, how, how soon did the trail narrow down where you wanted that position? Well, we had a bit of a road since we're doing yeah. it backwards. Usually from the start, uh, that you don't have long at all before the trail narrows. But it's not too bad because you're out there for three and a half hours or something <laughs> yeah. approaching three and a half hours, so it's, you're, not, you're not too worried about, about getting ahead real quick. And there's yeah. enough time on the road, just kind of in and out of trails and roads, yeah. so you've got yeah. that. And, and people are so courteous. This is a, not a uh, you know scratch and claw type race because <laughs> if you come up behind somebody and say, do you want to pass, just yeah. step off the trail and go by. It's not too bad. Great. Hey, well, congratulations to both of you. Thanks, Thanks for the time. Okay, well, we're at the finish line. Uh, Brian from Dino is with us here, and we've got the, uh, the winners just came across the mm -hmm. line. Uh, had a real nice time, a little slower than last year, yes. but not too surprising with the conditions. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the race itself. Oh, this race is a trail marathon. It's called the Tecumseh Trail Marathon. This is our eighth year. It's a fundraiser for the Hoosier Hikers Council. Okay. And the Hoosier Hikers Council built the Tecumseh Trail. And they built the Knobstone Trail. They, they're trying to connect those two to create a about a 150-mile length wow. hiking trail of the Knobstone Trail. And it would include the Tecumseh and the current Knobstone Trail and the area in between that's being worked on right now. That's a lot of southern Indiana. Yes, it is. That's a big piece. It goes all, it goes all the way from... Martinsville area yeah. all the way down to almost Louisville it's, so it's yeah. that's a that will be a huge hiking trail so well we're, we're in Yellowwood for. State Forest right that's now right in Brown County yep uh, and how far uh, I'll have you tell us about the change in the race originally it was about <laughs> it was 24.2 mile marathon well, 20, 26.2 miles is the marathon distance 26.2 now our uh, unusual uh, storm that came in last night dumped all this uh, yes. pretty snow, but it yes. made the roads treacherous. It, it did. Tell me uh, about having to make the decision to change things this morning. Well, the decision was actually out of my hands. What happened when we got up this morning is we noticed there happened to be several <laughs> inches of snow on the ground, and we were thinking about what might happen with the buses because right. we have to bus our runners from the finish line, which is right here, up to the start. And that's almost an hour-long bus trip to get them up there right. to the start. And so and you're we talking got a call. About 700 runners. We've got 700 registered. Usually, wow. uh, we have about 600 that would actually run. 600, okay. 650 would actually run. Okay. And so 
the bus company called me and said they're not going to do it. <laughs> so the decision was made for me, okay. and we had to come up with a backup plan. Fortunately, I had enough time before that I actually got that call to, to think about how we were going to work that, and we created an out-and-back course that started and finished right here at Yellowwood State Forest. They didn't use the first half of the normal course at all. They just ran backwards on course, turned around, and came back. Okay. Now, did we, we had close to 650, 700 then were actually running. I, I, I was one of the guys who was up at the start line, so <laughs> I missed the start here yeah, at the finish yeah, line. Um, yeah. But we, we found the runners yeah. uh, eventually. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about the, the, the launch of the race. How okay. did it go and how many did you have? I don't know the exact number yet. Okay. We, we haven't actually got everything squared away in our computer okay. system, but I'm going to guess that we're probably in the mid-500s range. I know the weather has okay. kept some people away. Sure. So we're probably 550 to 600 up there. Upper end would be about 600 people. So it's, uh, it was a little challenging. We had some people who did go to the start. They're not, uh, su it's not suggested that they drive themselves <laughs> to the start, but some do. And those that did that, um, they had to find their way back. Which and, we all did. And, and it was, uh, so we had some late starts. We're going to give them a time credit so that they actually can, okay. can see their real time compared with all the other runners. With, with the, the change in the race going up to what, mile 16 or station 16 and then back, did you end up with the same amount of uh, distance? Yeah, the distance is the same. Okay. A mar marathon is always 26.2 miles, so okay. we ran to about the 13.1 mile mark, okay. made a U-turn, and came right back with them. I mean, you know, that 26.2, uh, that, that, that's a fair piece to run in conditions like yes, this. Yes, and this is a tough place to do it. The trails here are very challenging. They're right. very steep and can be narrow in places and with the snow it makes it extremely hard. It's an extremely hard There's a hard lot race. of elevation change yes. over and over again. Yes. Uh, some of the trails are kind of rocky. Yep. Uh, of yep. course one of the runners was telling us the snow actually helps cushion where it normally have the exposed uh -huh. roots and rocks. So true, true. Hey, you, yeah. you, you got to find the positive <laughs> in everything. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. You know, uh, Brian, I'd like to go ahead and uh, tell me just a little bit about Dino and some of the other events that you do during Okay. The well, this event, as we mentioned, is a fundraiser for the Hoosier Hikers Council, right. and it's unique in the way we partner up. But Dino is, stands for Do Indiana Off-Road, and we have about 22 different events every year. They're about half trail running like this one, but we have all distances from 5K on up to this marathon. And the mountain bike series that we offer has seven races throughout the year, and they, you featured that on one of your shows earlier. Right. And that has a variety of levels from introductory racers to up to expert pro type racers. And you have really good attendance at all those yep, events too. Yeah, are, those are big events too. Yeah. Not, not quite this big. This is our biggest one every year, sure. this event here. But but why the beginning? It's December 4th. <laughs> you run the risk of ice and snow every year. Yes. Why would you pick your biggest event of the year <laughs> <laughs> this time of year? Because the, the runners like it actually they like the, the weather being a challenge yeah. you'll see that they're a all pretty smiles, happy they're very happy yeah. there, even yeah. though it's brutal conditions they, they love it yeah and we actually the reason we did it this time of year the first time was because of schedules of other races our own event schedules that we had set and other marathons that were going on this yeah. is a time of year when there's not many to compete with us <laughs> so we put it here and it's stuck it's it seems to be the, the date that's this, stuck this is eight eighth year this is the eighth year eighth year so yeah, yeah and, and i Talk to some of the volunteers, and they've been coming for years yeah. to help out. Yeah, the volunteers, most of the volunteers on the course are from the Hoosier Hikers right. Council, and they do a fantastic job. They really go all out to provide for the runners. Some of them have hot foods yeah. at the aid stations. There's music. I think you were at that aid station. Oh, we had some <laughs> great Christmas music playing. The, uh, the little bridge across the creek was decorated in Christmas yeah. the Christmas decorations. Yeah, they do, they do a fantastic job. They get into it. Tell, tell me about the aid stations. Uh, if we had normally been from start to finish, how many aid stations are there, and what is their purpose? Mm -hmm. There's normally 10 aid stations. They're about every two to three miles on average throughout the course. And the first ones serve mostly water and a sports drink. Okay. Then as you get farther along, we start offering other things like uh, cookies, pretzels, bananas, energy foods right. that they can take. Some of them have hot liquids to drink, so hot, hot cocoa or soup to help for those people who are getting really cold. Okay. So it's, the goal of those aid stations is to support the runners. It's also a place where we have ham radio communications to make sure if anybody's hurt, sick, or needs to drop out, we take care of them at those locations. And uh, I parked next to an ambulance at one point too, so right. we've got uh, EMTs on site yeah. uh, if, if anything were needed. That's correct. Yeah, the ambulance roves, uh, roams around as needed to different locations should there be a problem. Uh, we have a finish line medic that takes care of finish line incidents that need to be taken care of too. Great. Well, I know you need to get back to announcing, so mm -hmm. I appreciate the time Thank here. You.
Stay tuned, we'll be right back with more Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Looking for adventure? Marengo Cave has it all. Explore the underground wonders of Marengo Cave with our two easy walking tours or go on an adventurous cave exploring trip with hard hats and lots of mud. Kids will love discovering gemstones at the Cave Springs Mining Flume. This U.S. National Natural Landmark has been open to the public since 1883 and provides breathtaking views of underground cave formations. Visit us online at MaringoCave.com and plan your visit today. If you've dreamed of a western big game hunt or a summer vacation, Wind River Outfitters, Idaho's finest guide service, offers exciting fully guided hunts for elk, mule deer, black bear, and mountain lion, as well as summer fishing trips in the Gospel Hump Wilderness Area of Central Idaho. Accessible only by foot or horseback, the area reserved exclusively for Wind River Outfitters provides exceptional hunting opportunities. You'll enjoy hunting on a whole new level. Visit www.windriveroutfitters.com for more information. The Old Goat Trading Post in Bloomingdale, Indiana offers not only traditional fur hides, hats, and mountain man-like apparel, but beautifully crafted spirit hides. Artistically sculpted from elk, moose, deer, and buffalo hides, they are the perfect wall hanging for your home or vacation cabin. The shaved hair sculpture and original painted scenes combine to create a natural canvas and work of art. Visit www.oldgoattrading.com for more information. Follow Indiana Outdoor Adventures online with Facebook, Twitter, and our website. Stay up to date with our exciting adventures as we're out in the field filming and meeting new people. From news updates and announcements to Twitter posts by co-host Troy McCormick. Why wait until the next season of shows when you can follow us as we're filming them? Join us online to get the most current news on Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Welcome, we're in southeastern Indiana today with a man called Critter. And we're here, we're gonna to talk about his camera in the woods setup called the Critter Window. So let's go and uh, uh, find out a little bit more about Critter and about this online wildlife viewing that he has. The Critter Window is a uh, wildlife internet uh, webcam system. Um, we have quite a variety of uh, wildlife and uh, I've just kind of a side hobby that I bring to the internet for people to view. And the idea is you, you've opened your woodland property uh, to anybody on the internet that wants to take a look and watch the wildlife. Uh, that's right, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, matter of fact, our uh, one year birthday is coming up January 7th. Wow. Now tell me a little bit about the system itself. Um, how many cameras, what kind of cameras, uh, those kinds of things that, that allows us to see the wildlife. Well, the number of cameras uh, vary. Um, you, you really never know. I've got like seven uh, out in the woods now, but I uh, always move the cameras, change cameras. Uh, if one gets old, something new. Um, I like to keep the variety um, so it doesn't get boring. Tell me about the placement of the cameras and some of that limitation comes from trying to get the signal back here to the computer center. Well, yeah, um, I don't use a, a wireless system. I actually use a professional closed circuit television system. Um, just like you'd see in any store, uh, Walmart, grocery store, anything like that. Um, I find that it's a lot better quality of a camera. So it's like it's a closed circuit security system, basically. Yes, exactly. Okay, and, and that allows you by by going to a security system like that. Those systems were already set up for multiple camera views and managing those views. Correct, and I can also record all the cameras at one time and play them back at one time if I wish. Mm -hmm. Well, right now um, I'm uploading all the video uh, through DSL, which any of you know DSL is. Better than dial-up, but not as good as cable. And uh, I only had one video feed for quite most of the year. And here within the last month, I've added a second video feed. So now we have two, and that pretty much takes all of my upload bandwidth um, to get the quality, acceptable quality, up to the Internet. So now, from this room to a tree house that I have out in the woods is my central location for all my cables and all of my power runs to this tree house out in the woods. 
and that's about 550 feet from this room. Then all the cameras run from there out into the woods. How far do those runs go? Probably another 100 feet or so. Um, I get people from all over the world, um, all walks of life. Um, I get a lot of bird watchers. I get a lot of uh, retired or disabled people that uh, can't get out into nature the way they used to. And uh, that's what most of my group is. Now, you mentioned from around the world. Give me some examples of where are they from? I have viewers from Europe, the UK, uh, French, uh, Canada, uh, had one in, in the other day from Japan. Um, we've had just about every country in the world at one time or another has okay. been to the critter window. Right now I have uh, two video feeds and each video feed has two cameras each. So whichever camera has activity on it on that particular feed is the one that we will see. So if there's nothing going on on any of them then it just sits kind of still and waits, waits for something to come along. Okay. And you do help that along a little bit by putting out some corn, some suet cakes? Uh, yeah, um, I have a, a feed mixture that I've pretty much come up with that works well here with the, the different critters that we have. I feed uh, a mixture of sunflower seed, cracked corn, and whole corn. Okay. Tell me about some of the critters. What, what are your uh, ultimate moments and who are the regular visitors? Regular visitors are umpteen bird, thousand birds. Um, we get lots of cardinals and the blue jays. Um, a lot, it's amazing how many people around the world have never seen cardinals or blue jays. And uh, with their bright colors, they really show up on camera well, and people just love them. Um, we get muskrats. We get mice. We get uh, beavers. Uh, we get beavers that come and feed. Uh, coyote, deer. Um, red-tailed hawks, owls, um, we've even had uh, the owls and the red-tailed hawks um, actually catch muskrats right on camera. And, uh, uh, during the spring, uh, the ducks just about ate me out of house and home. Um, the, we must have had 50 baby ducks, uh, from the mallards to the uh, wood ducks. The wood ducks are beautiful on camera. Um, get to watch them go through their molting stages and uh, watch all the babies grow up. Well, Critter, uh, we want to thank you for having Indiana Outdoor Adventures here. And people, we want you to go and look at his webpage, The Critter Window. And uh, you can see some all kinds of animals, all hours of the night and day. And uh, we're on a beautiful piece of property. And Critter, we just can't thank you enough for having us out. Glad to have you. Anytime. Good luck with the project and uh, hope things keep expanding and your viewer numbers increase and uh, that's the goal. Good luck with it now. Thank you very much.